Good morning, friends. My name is Hannah. It's a joy to be with you. It was a delight to receive Nathan's invitation to be here. I went to seminary years ago, but God's call on my life has led me outside of the local church, so I don't get to preach as often as I thought I might. I did bring a special picture with me today. Does anyone know what this is? A broken pot, a dish? Yes. This is a piece of pottery, but it's not just any piece of pottery. If you can look, you can see that there are golden lines running through it. And this pot was once broken, but it has since been repaired using a special technique from Japan called kintsugi. Kintsugi means golden joinery or golden repair. When a pot or plate like this breaks, instead of throwing it away or discarding it, Kintsugi highlights the cracks. They use a special coating of gold, platinum, or silver to not just make those cracks go away, but to have them stand out. The flaws of the plate are actually more um, visible. I imagine that this plate is a lot like what it means to be human. We're all broken and wounded. We all have our cracks and our sharp edges. We have imperfections and weaknesses, we make mistakes, and it can be pretty easy to try to hide those things away. But those weaknesses can become strengths with God's love and grace. In just a moment, we will hear Paul's bold reflection on weakness. Like this bedazzled pottery, instead of allowing our flaws to diminish us, we can embrace them. Our mistakes and imperfections are not sheer failures, but can lead us to something more. Let us listen now for Paul and how he found strength in his weakness and how we might do the same. Let us pray. God of power and grace, fill us with the wisdom of your word and the understanding of your spirit so that we may be your church a people with dreams and visions at work in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from, from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 10, which can be found on page 226 of the New Testament of your pew Bibles or on the screen. Let's read this together. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person I don't know where we are, but where such a person, whether in the body well I'm God knows was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think of me, me than what is seen in me or heard from me even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, but he said, My grace is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness, so I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. I can be impulsive. 
envious, and self-centered. I can be controlling, and sometimes I struggle to do even the most basic math problems in my head. I lack self-confidence, and I'm very quick to lose my temper with my toddler. I can be incredibly socially awkward, just in case you'd like to greet me after the service. I've broken hearts, and I've said things without thinking them through. I've lied, I've gossiped, I've quit things because they were too hard. And unlike Paul, I have never thought to boast of any of these things. In fact, I can't remember a time I've stated these things aloud quite so publicly. And to consider these flaws, or a, a strength, or a power, as Paul suggests we might do, simply laughable. Can you imagine if instead of bringing a resume of our educational achievements, our accomplishments, and our leadership roles, we instead presented future employers or academic institutions with a list of our weaknesses, flaws, and failures? Unheard of. Boasting of weakness looks even stranger when you look at the world around us. We live in a world that values strength, power, and success. We valorize superheroes. We invest heavily in our military. We cheer on those who climb the corporate ladder. And we constantly seek more wealth and more stuff. It's easy to forget that this life of brute strength and power is maybe not the only way. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he boldly reminds us that there is power in weakness and that vulnerability in the hands of God can be a dynamic, transformative tool. In fact, Paul describes a situation in which he asks God to remove his thorns, to remove his flaws and imperfections, and God responded, my grace is sufficient for you, my power is made perfect in weakness. Now this might catch us off guard, but it shouldn't. Not really. After all, Jesus came to earth as a baby, utterly dependent on his mother. Jesus washed the feet of others rather than insisting that those wash his feet. Jesus rode into town on a donkey, not a royal chariot. He died and suffered on the cross. But the world that we have crafted has shifted us a little bit far from this life that Jesus showed us. We've learned to show no fear to keep our cards close to our chest, and to maintain absolute certainty. And I want to be clear, I don't think this is just a a modern problem. Paul's message of, let us boast gladly in our weakness, would have been shocking to those listening and reading his words at the time. In fact, the foundation of Paul's conversation with the church at Corinth was based on this strength. You see, the people of Corinth weren't convinced that Paul was credible. They weren't convinced that he was an authority. They were beginning to question him. There were other teachers who were coming into town, and they were preaching, and these cracks were beginning to form. So here is the landscape where Paul shares and boasts of his weakness, a place where, I don't know, I assumed a more dominant resume might have done the trick. A few years ago, I found myself at an event with local business owners and entrepreneurs. It was a diverse panel of women speaking on the challenges of starting something new. And one woman, Lisa, said something that I will never forget. She said, everyone asks me about all the companies I have started and the projects that have taken off, but I don't think that's an accurate picture of my spirit or success. She went on to say, we don't list the failures in our bios. We don't list the struggles, the asks we made that stopped at no, the ideas that crashed and burned, but we should. We should list and talk about these things because it's not failure if you persevere. From each failure we learn about ourselves and others, and our failures can become valuable assets. I think what she was getting at was this idea that her strength as a businesswoman had grown from her weakness that she was able to persevere, to move on from her failures and not sit in them. Lisa didn't mention anything about Jesus that day, and I don't know if she would claim Christianity, but I think that we within the Christian tradition can share her wisdom. Paul's strength came from knowing his weakness and looking outside of himself for the strength and grace of God. When I read 2 Corinthians, I find it most interesting that nowhere in Paul's letter does he say that weakness is the opposite of strength. 
He doesn't say that weakness is the opposite of power. He says, whenever I am weak, I am strong. He says power is made perfect in weakness. He says that weakness is a kind of power. But it's a kind of power we don't wrestle with very often. There are some modern teachers who have described four different expressions of power in order to help us think a little bit more broadly about how we might use power in the world. And I think exploring these four expressions can be helpful both to understand Paul's words and to understand how we might use power as Christians today. So these four expressions are power over, power with, power to, and power with. So we have power because we take it. We wield it over people in ways that can be inequitable and unjust if we aren't cautious. This is the power that those preachers who were coming into Corinth were using over Paul. They wanted to take credibility. But when we use power over, it's easy to fall into a pattern of utilizing this power over against others and the earth. We don't or can't break free because we always want more. But there are other ways. There's also power with. This is when we build community and commonality and community with others. This power is based on solidarity and collaboration. When we have power with, we can build bridges and coalitions to work together. Power to, which is the unique potential that each one of us has to shape our life and our world. We all have the power to make a difference. This is, comes from our self-worth and our self-knowledge. It comes from our ability to recognize differences and still treat people with respect. Too often, I look at power as one concrete idea. I think it's either good, it's something that we have or we gain or do we desire or we wield, or it's bad. Those who have power are corrupt, irresponsible, and oppressive. But as we believe in a God that shows us something more. We believe in Jesus Christ, power, a power to change systems and structures, a power to build community, and to do so with those that are different from him. So why can't we also believe, however uncomfortable it might be, that there is power in each of our weaknesses? This is a power that Dutch priest and professor Henry Nouwen wrote about in his book, The Wounded Healer. In it, he writes about whether Christian leaders can possibly be prepared to care for hurting people. He says, our service or our ministry will not be perceived as authentic unless it comes from a heart wounded by the suffering about which we speak. Nothing can be written about ministry without a deeper understanding of the ways in which ministers can make their own wounds available as a source of healing. Now, I want to be clear. I don't think now is saying that we should bleed all of our trauma all over people. He's not saying we should make the conversation ourselves. He's also not saying that you have to have experienced the same weakness or suffering to walk alongside someone who else is suffering. He is saying, though, that helping to heal the world starts with deep self-awareness of our own personal struggles. Sadness, our anger, our anxiety, and our inadequacy, we can empathize with others. Like the great psalmist throughout scripture, we mustn't stifle our emotions. We must accept our distress and speak honestly. For Nowen and for Paul, the main question is not how can we hide our wounds? How can we hide our weakness? But how can we put our woundedness in the service of others? Recently, I've been wondering how this might impact our larger church communities. You see, a commitment to power over is testing our very credibility as a witness of the good news. Our church committees and boards and teams might think, you know, we can't talk about public witness or evangelism or justice because we have all of these other weaknesses. We have budgetary concerns. We have shrinking numbers. We have aging congregations. But today's scripture pushes us from this, saying that even with our struggles and our weaknesses, we have power. My great aunt is infamous for her annual Christmas card. It's received each December with earnestness and anticipation. 
We all gather around to read it. But it isn't what you might expect. Yes, she wishes us well, bids us a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. But she also sends a long, typed letter of all that has happened to her in her orbit over the past year. And she is known to highlight some of the most isolating and terrible parts. One year, she shared about Uncle Donnie's hemorrhoids. Another of her ongoing feud with her neighbor over the correct way to mow the grass. She spells out the tests and doctor's appointments associated with her aging. She tells of her daughter's promotion and bemoans that it didn't come with a big enough raise. She isn't afraid to tell us who disappointed her or the failures of those around her. And we've come to love this quirky letter because it makes us laugh, but also because there's power in her honesty. There's no filter on her life, especially around her weaknesses. But the other thing is that she doesn't blame others for these things that's happened throughout the year. She doesn't blame God. She doesn't blame other people, which I think is fitting because if you read Paul's letter, the Corinthians, he doesn't say that God caused those thorns. He doesn't say that God caused suffering. My great aunt's many God. Rather, through her hardship, she believes God is helping her to learn and grow. Now, I don't think God is asking us to send a yearly letter of our hardships, and I don't think God is asking us to write out a resume of our weaknesses. But I do think God is asking us to pay attention to those thorns, to our weaknesses and our flaws. God is urging us to see power in a new way, to notice and to use our weakness as there is possibility even in these shadowy parts of ourselves. In this weakness, not only can we begin to heal ourselves and provide a healing presence to others, we can begin to heal our faith communities and heal the world. God may not be able to take away our thorns, our weaknesses, and our hardships, but God's grace is sufficient. It is enough to help us through and if we pay attention, if we remember the kind of power that Jesus holds and that Paul sought to hold, we too can begin to see and use our weakness as a truly transformative power for good. We're going to talk a little bit this morning on uh, the Wildwood Hills Ranch. As many of you know, and you're quite familiar with the ranch, might be some newcomers in here also, that uh, we adopted the Wildwood Hill Ranch a few years back as one of the local projects that Covenant would support through, through our mission giving and also through our participation. The, the Wildwood Hills Ranch is a refuge for abused and underprivileged children that have suffered, many suffered greatly at the expense of people that should have been taking care of them. It's a 10-year program where the ranch will pick up, take care of uh, children at the, from 8 to 18, basically. Now, they're not housed there all the time, but they keep in touch with them. They provide spiritual guidance and all kinds of other things to, to bring those children back from what has been, in many cases, devastating incidents in their life. We've had uh, Matt Meckel here a couple of times sharing with us videos of some of the experiences at the ranch. So it's a very, very worthwhile cause that we're happy to support. The second arm of the work at the at the ranch, and this is a fairly new one, fairly new, maybe five, seven years, something like that, is the equine therapy for veterans. Uh, we've all heard about the therapy, of, therapeutic effect of animals, companion dogs, and so forth. And they found at the ranch that the horses are of immense value to veterans who are suffering from PTSD, or other effects of their military service. And that's a, a very, very worthwhile effort, and it, it seems to be very well accepted by the veterans with some good, good uh, 
results. The, what you see on the screen is just the top part of a flyer that I have some copies I've put out on the table where the uh, name tags are for you to pick up afterwards. There's, there's an event on July 6th, which is a Saturday. I call it a Riding at the Ranch Festival. It's a, a very comprehensive program, and if you want to pick up a flyer, very comprehensive program of a whole bunch of stuff that's going to be going on at the ranch that day from 11 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night. There'll be music, there'll be food, there'll be water activities. They have a nice lake at the, at the ranch for swimming, fishing, uh, kayaking. There's all sorts of uh, activities that you'll find on that flyer. Today, th there's a discount uh, and today is the last day for the discount, but you can register. It's one of those things where if you're more, if you're more techy than I am, you can apparently just scan something on the sheet, and, that, and that'll buy your ticket. <laughs> I don't know how that works, but, but apparently it does. If you, if you want to save a little money, uh, they are also, and, the, and all this information is on the sheet, they're looking for volunteers. One of the items that's happening out there is an axe throwing contest. And we already have one volunteer. Bruce Anderson has volunteered to be the catcher. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was going to use it. <laughs> so take that. Um, the, the, uh, the camp is in session in June and July for the youth that come uh, that, that time of the year for a week, or I think in some cases two weeks. It's not, it, it is not in session the week of July 4th, and that's why the Saturday is uh, available for this activity that they've got uh, planned for that day. So if you have any interest in that, pick it up, take, it up, take a look at it, and the contact information is all on there. Who Caitlin Wilcoxon is the individual that you should get in contact with. That's on the back of the sheet. The other thing I remind you of is Covenant over the last few years has done a magnificent job to serve a group of over a hundred men that come to a Christian retreat at the ranch. The ranch, when it's not being used by, by the children is available for uh, public use for a fee. Businesses use it, families use it, organizations use it, and uh, it has wonderful accommodations for all of those. They host a, a men's retreat every year for over 100 men, and those 100 men have to get fed <laughs> along with lodging, and Covenant has responded magnificently in helping out with the, with the services, the food services. Preparation, serving, filling tables, filling what, what goes empty, cleaning up afterwards, and setting up for the next meal. Uh, those dates this year, and you'll get more information as we get closer, those dates this year are, they're joining, they're coming in on Thursday, September 19th, uh, be there Friday and Saturday, and leave after breakfast on Sunday. So there's a Thursday night dinner, and Warren Pitcher can attest to the value of that Thursday night dinner. That's Thursday night is usually the steak night, is that right? And then they have a little extra leftovers. <laughs> so there may be a big sign up for Thursday night, I don't know. <laughs> Thursday night. Uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner Friday and Saturday, and breakfast on Sunday. But you'll get more information. Last year, we had 22 different persons from Covenant that volunteered for that, for the, that helped out with that service. The director said, we couldn't have done it without you. So this year, maybe we can have 30 and get some new ones in, too. So thank you all, and think about the good stuff done at the ranch.